at First Methodist of Mount Holly. I do want to make you aware of a few things. Uh, first of all, the Mary Methodists are going to gather for a St. Patrick's Day lunch. Uh, those are the, the Mary Methodists are those of us who've had a couple more birthdays than the rest of you. <laughs> and, and we're celebrating that. It'll be March 14th in the Fellowship Hall, 1130 to 1 o'clock. Good food, we have a choice of grilled chicken tenders or lasagna, all sides, include salad, breadsticks, dessert, beverage, $12.50 per person. Uh, Deborah Cawthon is not able to be here today, but you can speak to Sandy Ingram, who is here today, and uh, tickets will be on sale until March the 10th. We'll have fun, games, and prizes. Wear green or get pinched. A few things to keep in mind. The JAMS Sunday School class is now meeting upstairs in the old parlor on the first floor uh, rather than down here. There are forms for Easter lilies. They're located in the fellowship hall. If you would like to order an Easter lily, we would be happy for you to do so. But we need to do that by March 10th, which is next Sunday. We do need help to work with media. So if you can do that and want to help out, Reese Todd is a young gentleman in the sound room over there. Please let him know. Uh, if you're interested in helping us serve communion once or twice a year, uh, and particularly that's for the 1055 service because we already have good help in this service, please get in touch with Carol Painter and let her know. Also, there is an attendance pad on your table. If you would sign it and, if possible, with phone number, email address, something of the sort, so I can get in touch with you and just let you know how happy we are to see you. Yes. Yes, we, we had a really, really nice crowd Wednesday night, but we were a little bit overwhelmed with how many people we didn't have, we didn't know how many were going to come. So on your pad, if you will let us know how many are coming, we welcome you. We're glad all of you are more than welcome. We have kids club for smaller children. We have youth group, and we also have an adult Bible study. So join us. It's at 545 on Wednesdays, but please note that on your pad. Also, uh, the, and this week, the Wednesday night meal will be served by the children's ministry, and we're having tacos, and they're not a day late. It's okay to have taco Wednesday as well as taco Tuesday. Uh, remember that on Easter Sunday, we're going to have three services, and believe it or not, you're welcome to come to more than one if you want to. Uh, we'll have a sunrise service at 7 a.m., in the upper parking lot, I'll bring a folding chair or lawn chair with you, and then immediately following that, we will have a breakfast with biscuits, et cetera. That's served by the men, the Wesley Brotherhood. We will still have our 832 contemporary service, Sunday school at 945, and traditional service at 1055. Uh, we do need some help at CRO with canned fruit and canned pasta. So please keep that in mind. Also, we need volunteers to help in the community garden, and you will see in your bulletin where to send those. Any other announcements you would like to make known? Thank you again for being here. Uh, I apologize for last week. I did not realize I was singing a solo on, on, uh, <laughs> on our live stream. I probably didn't, and I need to. I got a, I got a text this morning at 5.55 that we need it, which is fine because I was already up and wide awake. Uh, we have church cleanup day this Saturday at 9.30. So please come if you're able and pitch in and help us out. We would, we would love to see you. Church cleanup this coming Saturday, 9.30 a.m. Thank you, Karen. God is good. All the time. And all the time, God is good. let us stand as you are able and praise the Lord.
standing for just a moment for our responsive reading. It comes from the 19th Psalm. The heavens are telling the glory of God and the firmament proclaims God's handiwork. There is no speech nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. In them, God has set a tent for the sun, which comes forth like a bridegroom, leaving his chamber, and it runs its course with joy like a strong man. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. By the way, when, when we clap and praise the Lord at the end of our courses, first of all, we are saying thank you to our praise team who's very gifted musically and ushers us into the presence of God. We're also applauding the Lord, whose grace is beyond our comprehension. We have come here to praise and to give thanks. 
I do want us to have prayer at this time. Uh, some of you may already be aware, but Karen Hefner has been in the hospital at Presbyterian for several days, been in, in really dire straits uh, in the ER for two days before she got a, a room of her own. And she's making progress, but she's still very sick, and she needs our prayers. Please continue praying for Jeff Abernathy as he recuperates from his recent surgery. Please continue praying for Paige Lowe as she recuperates from her shoulder surgery. Oh, and Jeff had a knee replaced. Paige had major surgery on her shoulder. Tommy and Deborah Cawthon are unable to be with us today uh, because they have been sick. There's been a lot of the crud going around, including uh, some flu that does not show up on test, which is sort of scary. So be in prayer for many among our family who are not able to be with us at this time. Anyone else want to make a spoken prayer request before we go to God in prayer? Yes, Bill? Yes, let us pray for Jeff Ross, who has just found himself unemployed. Anyone else? My memory sometimes is faulty, but God's is not. Howard? Yes, let us remember John. Remember Howard's cousin, his father. There are a number of family members and friends, and God does hear and answer our prayers. Anyone else before we go to God in prayer at this time? Let us pray. I ask you to join your heart together with mine. Oh, Lord, what a blessing it is to gather here in this church and sing praises to you because you are worthy of praise so we literally raise a hallelujah. We, we raise praises unto you because you are worthy of our praise. We are declaring your worth as we sing to you and glorify you. What a blessing it is. And invisibly, you are present. You are present here in a mighty way. I pray that each one under the sound of my voice this morning, those who are watching us on live stream, those who are gathered here in the fellowship hall, I pray that each would feel the presence of God right now. I pray that your Holy Spirit was, would rest upon them. As the fog has descended upon Mount Holly, I pray that your Spirit would descend upon each of us. Fill us to overflowing. Help us to minister and manifest the joy of the Lord, which is our strength. Lord, you've heard these requests that have been made known. The heart of your gospel tells us that through the death and resurrection of Jesus, we are healed of our diseases and injuries. Through his death and resurrection, we are also saved from our sins. Lord, your benefits are many, and for these we are thankful. We give you praise, honor, and glory this morning. I pray, O oh Lord, that everything that we say and do and even think in this service would be pleasing in your sight. O oh God, move amongst us. And I pray that if there's anyone here that does not yet know you before they leave today, I pray that they would make that decision that Joshua said in your word, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We ask these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hear the word of God from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 18 and following. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning 
I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scholar? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. God decided through the foolishness of the proclamation, or other, other translations just say the foolishness of preaching, to save those who believe. For Jews ask for signs and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. When I was a child, my mother often used the term foolishness in reference to my behavior. Barry, what kind of foolishness are you into now? Actually, that continued on into adulthood. And in fact, my mother and her family, the pages, uh, usually would call me by my first and last name when I was engaged in what they considered foolishness. Uh, interestingly, Daddy's family would refer to me by my first and middle name, which was my mother's maiden name. So I knew I was in trouble. And if I heard all three names, it was really foolishness. But what is this foolishness about which the Word of God speaks? The, the Greek word that is translated here is moria. It means silliness, absurdity, ridiculousness, blockheadedness. Blockheadedness. As a fan of Peanuts and Charlie Brown, I really appreciate the blockheadedness. I can unfortunately relate to that pretty well. Perhaps some of you can too. Blockheadedness. I remember mother's comments. And she was right. Sometimes I was involved in foolishness. Other times I was not. It was interesting. Uh, another year, another place, there was a sermon of mine that was live streamed. And a minister of another denomination watched it and contacted me and said, your preaching is absolute foolishness. <laughs> I said, thank you. I appreciate that. And, <laughs> and, and uh, he just said, you, you have way too much fun in the pulpit. You need to take seriously what you're doing. You're proclaiming the gospel. You're proclaiming the word of God. And I said, indeed, I am. I said, I also understand that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And I was baptized in water and in the Holy Spirit in fire. I was not baptized in vinegar. Therefore, joy of the Lord is my strength. Once upon a time for a children's message, I used Tickle Me Elmo as an object lesson. It's all right for the children of God to smile and to laugh and to have joy. In fact, if we don't have joy in the world, why would the world want what we have? But preaching seems to be foolishness to those in the unbelieving world. And by the way, not everybody, my style obviously did not go along with what this gentleman thought that preachers should be like. But there are folks that are doing things now that are reaching people for Jesus that are a bit unorthodox. Uh, once upon a time, I used to watch the TV show Moonshiners fairly regularly. If anybody else jumps in, I think a few of you have been there as well. And Tyler from Kentucky is now preaching the gospel. And, and Tyler is probably reaching people that uh, I couldn't touch. Uh, likewise, there, there are others who, you know, who feel very comfortable with spiked hair and holy jeans and so forth. I have no problem with that. If I had more hair, I might spike mine too, but I don't. <laughs> and it doesn't work for me, and I would look ridiculous at my age anyway. But who am I to judge those folks and say that they're foolish because Jesus said, if they're not against me, they're for me. Or let me put it in hillbilly terms, if they ain't against us, they fur us. And I'm appreciative of those who are on our side. And I want people on God's side indeed. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, the King James Version says. We, as the children of God, ought to have the joy of the Lord. But to the unbelieving world, our preaching is foolishness. Our lifestyle is foolishness. 
Why is it foolishness? Because the gospel itself is foolishness to the unbelieving world. Think about this for just a moment. If you are not a Christian, the idea of God sending his son to this world to die for our sins on our behalf and then have the gall to rise from the dead in order to purchase a place in heaven for us and to be the first fruits or the firstborn from the dead so that we too one day will rise from the dead. That's radical. You realize that? We've heard it all our lives. We live in the Bible Belt. We've heard that message countless times probably. That is the heart of the gospel. And if you are not a born-again Christian, to you that might be foolishness. But to those of us who believe, it's not foolishness. It's good news. Is it good news for you this morning? It is good news that he loved us enough to die for our sins, to die for our healing as well as our forgiveness. Indeed, the heart of the gospel is actually found in what some, some of us like to call the gospel of Isaiah. In Isaiah 53, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, written about 750 years before Jesus was crucified, verse 4 of Isaiah 53, Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Here is the heart of the gospel. He died for our healing. He died for our forgiveness and salvation. That, my friends, is truly good news. And I encourage you, if you have never made that decision, echoing again Joshua 24, 15, choose you this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will choose to serve the Lord. Indeed, there is a story in the Old Testament where there's a choice put before the children of Israel. There were two mountains, one called Ebal and the other called Gerizim. Easy to remember, E is in evil, G is in good. Ebal was the choice for evil. Gerizim was the choice for good. Which one of those are you going to choose? Indeed, by his stripes, we are healed. At the 1055 later this morning, in our choir, there are going to be two men who in the past six months have both been told by their medical doctors that they are walking miracles. By his stripes, we are healed. Do you believe in the supernatural power of God, or do you not? To our world, faith is foolishness because we're praying to something that is invisible. True story about 20 years ago. 9-11 was was still fresh in the memory of most Americans. And on the campus where I worked, there was a particular professor. Actually, she did not teach in the religious studies department. She taught in political science. But she was a vicious anti-Semite. She hated the Jews. She hated Israel. She hated Christianity. And would spew that all over our campus email to the point that Professors lost the privilege of sharing on campus email. But I remember that, and somehow she persuaded the people who were in charge of the religious studies department at that time, and I was just part-time, and I didn't have a whole lot of influence then. I was fairly new in my position. And they persuaded the college to invite this gentleman to come and speak to us on September 11th. This would have been about 2004. And so they invited this Hindu gentleman from East Carolina, which is about 45 minutes away from there, and they invited him to speak on world peace. So he came, and lots of faculty members attended, and they gave incentives or extra credit to their students to attend this gentleman's lecture. Uh, by the way, the, the gentleman, nice fellow, I ate lunch with him, uh, had a conversation with him, He's not a professor of religious studies. He just happens to practice Hinduism. But he spoke, and he began by saying, it is an insult to another human being 
to try to convert them to your religion and tell them that your religion is superior to theirs. Now, that was the first sentence that he spoke. Then he rambled on for an hour, here, there, and yonder. Some of you are thinking, well, Pastor, I've heard you ramble on for an hour. too." <laughs> this, I, I'll let God judge what was said. But he closed by giving an altar call to Hinduism. <laughs> I thought, wait a minute, I've just been insulted. We've all just been insulted because he's trying to convert us to his religion. So his solution for world peace was that we would all become Hindus. By the way, you might not realize this, but the nation of Pakistan is primarily Muslim. The nation of India is primarily Hindu. Both of those nations have nuclear weapons, and they are aimed across the border at each other. And they have fought like cats and dogs ever since they became independent nations in 1948. Anyway, in contrast, I invited a gentleman named Dr. Michael Berry. Dr. Berry worked for Cancer Treatment Centers of America. He had several published books which were based on empirical research. Again, this, this gentleman is a medical doctor, a published author, a, a scholar, if I've ever met one, worked for Cancer Treatment Centers of America in Philadelphia. He came to share that his research and the research of many others has proven that those who are Christians heal more quickly than those who are not. And that those who pray are healed more quickly than those who do not. And he had all of this very impressive empirical research. I tried to persuade as many faculty members to come as I could. I think three showed up. None of them incentivized attendance for their students. He actually had something that was legitimate to say, but to the unbelieving world, it was foolishness. It was foolishness. By the way, in medical science, there are plenty of folks who realize that the spiritual realm is a very important part of physical healing. Uh, they have at Presbyterian in Charlotte a really nice lounge and chapel, a lounge just for pastors, a chapel for people to pray. To the unbelieving world, what we believe and do is foolishness. But to those of us who believe, it is the power of God and it is the salvation of God. There is an abbreviation that pops up fairly often nowadays, especially on social media, it is the letters I-Y-K-Y-K. -Y -K. And it means if you know, you know. If you know Jesus and you know the joy of forgiveness, then you know. If you know the guilt being lifted off of you, the burden being lifted off of your conscience, you know. It makes no sense to you if you have never accepted the forgiveness that Jesus Christ offers. But for those of us who know, it is powerful. Noah had a hammer in his hand building an ark. Noah was in the middle of the desert. It rarely rained there, if ever. And he's building this enormous vessel out of wood in the middle of the desert. I have no doubt that people thought that Noah was engaged in foolishness. But Noah had faith. And they laughed at him and then it started to rain. Moses had a rod in his hand and stood before the Red Sea. I have no doubt that there were people that thought that Moses was a fool holding that rod in his hand, expecting it to part the Red Sea when he prayed over it. Then the sea parted and people stopped laughing. David, as a little teenage boy, had a slingshot. Now, I actually have a slingshot from Israel that Karen and I bought when we went there together in 1998, February of 98. We were in Bethany. Bethany was the place where Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And there were some Israeli gentlemen there that were demonstrating these slingshots. Now, by the way, when we think slingshot, we may be thinking of something with a rubber strap, and you might hold it in, in your hand like this, or even there's something called a wrist rocket that goes all the way up your forearm, and it's powerful, and you can actually hunt small animals with that. 
But this slingshot looks nothing like you would expect. There is a little yarn pocket about that big and then a strand of yarn going out each end of it. It looks flimsy. It looks fragile. When you see that, you think there is no way that you could kill a human being with that. It looks like a joke. But these gentlemen were demonstrating the power and the accuracy of that little slingshot. And they would put a stone in that little pocket, which was also knitted with yarn. And, and they would swing it around, and then at the right time, they would release one of those threads. And that rock would go sailing through the air so fast you could hear it whistle. In fact, it would, from here where I stand right now, you could knock out a window in a car out on Main Street. And they showed us again and again. I was amazed at the distance and the speed and the accuracy of that little yarn slingshot. Indeed, little David, just a teenage boy, Goliath laughed at him. Goliath said, is this the best you've got to offer? And Goliath quit laughing after David used the little slingshot that God gave him. The slingshot was foolishness in the eyes of the world, just as Moses' rod and Noah's hammer. In a moment, we're going to come to the table. Jesus' bread and wine is foolishness to the world. When I was a small child and did not understand the gospel, I asked my parents once, why are they so skimpy with refreshments this morning? Because I was just a little kid. I was a toddler and I didn't understand the gospel. But now that I understand that Jesus gave his body to be broken for us, shed his blood to wash away our sins, now it's not foolishness anymore. When we come to the Lord's table, it's a place of salvation. It's a place of forgiveness. It's a place of healing. It's a place of grace. I am thankful for that. The bread and wine Jesus spoke of, it's the story of salvation. By the way, some of you realize that it is a story as opposed to a story. You've heard stories before. This is not one of them. This one is true. This one is legitimate. This is literally gospel truth. And if you know, you know. Preaching is foolishness in the eyes of the world, in the eyes of those who do not believe. But those of us who are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, for us, it is the power of God. It is the salvation of God. Thanks be to God for his grace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now I ask Jimmy Felton if he would come up and assist me, please, with communion. And if Reese will put the communion service up on the screen, we will proceed with that momentarily. And I ask you, when it is in bold print, I ask you to join with me. Christ our Lord invites to this table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news, brothers and sisters. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you. Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth, O Lord, to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and by the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you, Father. He gave it to his disciples. And then he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So I invite first the praise team to come forward and commune. Then they may come up to the front and play softly as the rest of us come one at a time to commune. The body of Christ broken for you.
Baptist. This is our stewardship month, and Melanie Abernathy is the chair of our finance committee, and she's going to share with you briefly. Good morning.
true story. I promise I'm not giving you another sermon. My granddaddy Paige was a sharecropper. They were the poorest category of white people in the South. All dirt poor. Mother said during the Depression, if she got a 10-cent toy, it was a really good Christmas. And he was a tither. He and his wife, my grandmother Clara Bell Burroughs Page, they were tithers. True story. All five of their children ended up at some point in time being millionaires. Now, I'm not going to tell you all of you are going to turn out being millionaires, and I'm, I'm not one, by the way. I've been in ministry for 40 years. <laughs> but, but I will say, if you, if you will obey God, God will bless you. And I have found that his word is true. Thank you, Melanie. I realize that's uncomfortable for some of you, but it's biblical and it is truthful. But God blessed that family because they obeyed the word. When I was a very small child, my parents got audited by the IRS because the agent, the auditor said, nobody in your income category gives as much as you give. And all, they had all the documentation and they backed off. And there was no problem with that. God is good. Praise team, please lead us in our final song. I ask you to stand.